OK, so I went back and corrected the schedule. Turns out we do have a holiday. I just put it on the wrong week. Um, so the holiday is in week six, October 10, which is our national day. Um, all of the other units are the same. The order is the same. I simply move the holiday to a different week. OK, today we're going to be talking about exposition essays. An exposition essay is simply an essay to introduce something or explain something to your reader. It has three parts. An introduction, an explanation, and a conclusion. Let's talk about the first and third parts, and then I'll talk about the explanation. The introduction has one job. You have to attract the reader's attention. You have to make the reader want to keep reading. And the way to do this is to build some kind of connection with your reader. Make them feel like it would be a good idea to read this essay. You can build a connection uh, by showing how this essay could be useful to the reader. Maybe it's important for the reader to know. Maybe it would be interesting and fun for the reader to read your essay. Whatever strategy you choose, they all mean that you have to think about what kind of person will be reading your essay. Now in this class, it's safe to assume that your main reader will be me, but also some of your classmates. So what kind of things might be useful to your classmates or important to your classmates? What might your classmates think is fun and interesting? And if your topic is neither useful nor important nor fun, you should try to make it look like one of these things. Um, maybe you will point out some part of your topic that could be interesting. Or maybe you can point out some way of looking at this topic that could be useful. But in some way, build a connection with your reader. If your reader doesn't want to read your essay. Uh, and they stop after the first paragraph. It doesn't matter how good your second, third, fourth paragraphs are. They're not going to read it. So the introduction builds a connection with your reader and you should also let your reader understand what is in your essay or let them kind of be able to guess or predict what your essay will actually talk about. Uh, we don't want to make a false commercial, right? You make a very good presentation for your essay and your essay actually is talking about something else. That's not a good introduction. Um, the conclusion, the third part of your exposition essay, should summarize what you have talked about, the important parts. What parts are important for the reader? Uh, if you began by saying that uh, there is useful information, then your conclusion should summarize that useful information. If you began by saying that this could be fun and interesting, uh, you should point out how fun and interesting it was to read your essay. Make the reader think that it was time well spent. Don't make them think they wasted their time. In addition, the conclusion at the very end, first you summarize and then you show the reader the future. If you gave the reader interesting information, suggest some ways that they can use that information. If you gave them important information, show them how their lives would be better after learning this information. If you gave them something fun and interesting, uh, show them how happier they are now that they know about this thing. 
right? So summarize what you have told the reader, the important parts, and then show the reader, point them toward the future. Um, a good conclusion is the end of the essay, but not the end of the idea. The idea can continue even after the essay. Okay, up to this point, do you have questions? Introduction and conclusion? Okay, the middle part, the explanation part. An exposition essay should introduce something or someone to the reader. Could be a, a thing, could be a person, could be some kind of process like cooking, could be an event, something that happened, could be a phenomenon, right? Pick something or someone and introduce it or explain it to the reader. Now, whatever you choose, there will be lots of information. So the key two questions are what to put in and what to leave out. And what order should these things be put in? Only put in information that is uh, directly relevant and important to your topic. So sometimes when we write, uh, we, may, we might think of some related thing and then go off in a different direction. But in your final draft, don't go off in that direction. Come back to your original topic. Now, what order should you put your information in? You can't just like put everything on the page, like you think of something and you put it down, you think of something, you put it down. Uh, that's not an essay, that's a collection of sentences. To make an essay that the reader can easily read and easily understand, you need to have some kind of order. The kind of order depends on your topic. Some topics, it makes sense to go from beginning to end, chronological order. Some topics, it makes more sense to go from end to beginning, reverse chronological order. Sometimes you'll go from outside in or inside out, top to bottom, bottom to top, left to right, local to global, global to local, abstract to concrete, or maybe concrete to abstract. It depends on your topic. But once you choose an order, follow the order. If you in the middle, you break the order, your reader can be easily confused. When we read, everything we read depends on everything we have already read before. So when you start reading something, you, your mind already comes up with expectations, ideas about what this essay will say, how it will say these things. If your essay in the middle breaks from these expectations, your reader will not expect them. It may be harder for your reader to understand. It may be harder for your reader to follow what you're talking about. So once you pick an order, stick with the order unless you have a very good reason not to. In writing, there is no 100% rule that you always have to follow. But if you decide to break a rule, you have to have a good reason. It has to be for a specific purpose. Um, so, you know, if you want to do some experiments, um, you can discuss with your classmates and later on discuss with me and we can talk about whether it is a successful experiment. But if you don't have a good reason, you should probably follow the rules. So that is the basic abstract idea of an exposition essay. Do you have questions? OK, so you have the basic idea. Now let's look at an example. This is from the textbook. Uh, page. It's very early in the textbook. Page two. Very early. 
So the title, Explorers and Planners, Ways to Discover and Organize Ideas. So from the title, it looks like we're going to be talking about two different ways to discover and organize ideas, right? One way uh, belongs to the explorers. The other way belongs to the planners. You're staring at a blank page or computer screen and encountering familiar questions. How do I start? What do I have to say? So this first sentence immediately builds a connection with the reader. By putting the reader in a situation. It's not saying like I something something. It's you are staring at a blank page. When you are in this situation, what do you do? So immediately you become connected and involved in this essay. You want to find out uh, how this story will continue. Everyone shares these problems, but they need not be serious obstacles. So this second sentence goes from you to everyone. So it's not just you personally. It's everyone else who is facing a blank page has these same questions. And so what this sentence does is if you just happen to be a genius writer who does not have this problem, you see a blank page, you immediately know what you want to write. The second sentence tells you almost everybody else has this problem. So if you want to be able to talk about writing with your friends, if you want to understand writing process, uh, you should recognize that this is a problem for most people. So it, in, it includes even those people who don't have this problem. This sentence guarantees that the opening connects with the reader. And it also gives us the main idea of the essay. Uh, not, these problems need not be serious obstacles. There are ways to begin writing. There are things you can try to come up with ideas when you face a blank page. That's what the essay is about, right? So the idea comes immediately in the second sentence. This is what the essay has to offer us readers. It's saying if we finish reading the essay, we will learn some ways to come up with ideas at the very beginning of the writing process. Since the average person can think ahead only seven words, plus or minus four, you probably do not begin a sentence knowing exactly how it will end or exactly what the next sentence will say. Therefore, it is almost impossible to anticipate the exact content of an entire paper. These two sentences explain the previous sentence, the previous sentence says everyone has this problem. Why? These two sentences explain it's because of the human brain. We can't learn everything in advance, so uh, it's impossible to know exactly what we are going to say. Therefore, everybody faces some kind of this problem. What do I say? How do I say it? Although some experienced writers approach their first drafts with clearly organized plans, you may not be one of them. Your thinking may be disorganized, but that is to be expected. So it comes back to you, the reader. Uh, this sentence basically says, um, like I told you, everyone has this problem. And you might be thinking, but wait, I heard about that genius author who doesn't have this problem. And so this essay says, OK, some experienced writers uh, are better prepared. But it's OK if you're not one of those writers. 
your thinking may be disorganized, but that is to be expected. It's normal. It's normal to not be a genius. The beginning stage of writing is a time to discover your ideas and plan out uh, how to present them over subsequent drafts. And there's more than one effective way to discover and plan through free writing, brainstorming, clustering, and outlining. This sentence tells the reader what the rest of the essay will talk about in detail. So the main idea is uh, here's how to come up with new ideas. But this sentence tells you, OK, I'm going to talk about free writing. I'm going to talk about brainstorming. I'm going to talk about clustering and outlining. This is the specific shape of the essay. It's always a good idea to include this kind of sentence so the reader can be prepared uh, for exactly what the essay will say. So that's what this introduction, uh, this first paragraph does. It builds a connection with the reader and it tells the reader what the essay will talk about. Of course, no two writers work in the same way. Everyone's ultimate goal is to produce a clear, convincing and engaging piece of writing. However, the process of arriving at that goal differs from person to person and often from task to task. So the first sentence introduces difference. People work in different ways. The essay says I will give you some ways. Uh, but then it says people work in different ways. The idea is um, not everybody follows the exact same method, and that's also OK. And then the next two sentences explain why. Why different people work in different ways. Uh, the end goal is the same uh, to produce a good piece of writing. But different people follow different kinds of process. And so if your process is different, your methods will be different. Now that the idea of difference is in the essay, we can now meet our two groups of people. On the one hand are the planners, first group of people. They carefully consider the structure and content of their ideas before writing them down. That's why they're called planners, right? They carefully consider and then they write. Then they revise their work only once or twice. So planners do most of their thinking before they write. On the other hand are the discoverers which means almost everyone else. So this tells us this essay will only talk about two groups of people, planners and discoverers. If you're not a planner, then you're a discoverer, according to the essay. They compose messy first drafts, sometimes with unrelated ideas, which they progressively clean up and reshape through multiple revisions. So if planners think and then write, discoverers write as a kind of thinking. They think on the page. That's why their process looks uh, more messy. One such discoverer was the Nobel Prize winning author Isaac Bashevis Singer. So we have an example. When asked how he went about composing his stories, he replied, there's no plan, no formula. I may revise something twice or a thousand times. So here's a question. Why do we only have an example of a discoverer? Why don't we have an example of a planner? Let's think about this. When you think about what is a good writer, do you first think of a planner or do you think of a discoverer? 
I think most of us would agree that uh, most of the time a good writer is someone who knows what they want to say before they write. That's the classic idea. This essay is telling us that actually both of them are fine. You can write, you can think and then write, or you can think while you write. Both are okay. But because most of us think that planners are usually the better writers, the essay needs to give you more proof that it's okay to be a discoverer. And so it gives you the example of this discoverer who won a Nobel Prize to show you uh, even if you're a messy discoverer kind of writer, you can still be a successful and good writer. So why is there only one example? Uh, is there only an example for one and not the other? Because the essay is predicting the reader's attitude. It's engaging the reader. It knows what you probably think, and it's reacting to your expectations. Whether writers are planners, discoverers, or a bit of both, their process of revision begins after the first draft. So in the last paragraph, we got two groups of people. And usually we expect the next paragraph to first talk about one group and then talk about the other group. But paragraph three actually puts both groups together. And the reason is because the ideas in this paragraph apply to both groups equally. So it's talking about both groups at the same time. For both planners and discoverers, uh, everything begins after the first draft. Then they can examine what they have said, see what ideas are emerging or incomplete, and decide which to discard, replace, expand, or refine. So for both groups of writers, they write something, they look at it, um, and they see what they are actually writing about, and they pick out which ideas are worth developing and which ideas should be thrown away. They may change their minds and wording two, three, or a dozen times until the ideas and language are clear and concise. So when they write a draft and they look at it, and then they'll write another draft and they'll look again, and then write another and look again, maybe two times, maybe three times, maybe 12 times. They keep going until they have a good draft. A writer's mind is filled with an ocean of ideas awaiting the chance to flow out. The task is to open the floodgates and channel the flow onto the page or screen. These two sentences are explaining what's going on when the writer writes and rewrites and rewrites. It's not enough to put your ideas on the page. You have to channel the flow. You have to guide the water into a good structure, a good order. So that's what the revising is for. Uh, first to get your ideas down and then put them in a good order. One method that discoverers use for getting started is free writing. So now we get a discussion of one group, one of the two groups. We start from the discoverers. And this paragraph introduces one method of generating ideas called free writing. First sentence, we get the name of the method. Then we get a description. What do you do for free writing? It involves writing down words as fast as possible without concern for exact phrasing, grammar, or spelling. The work is uncensored and perhaps illogical, but the main goal is merely to keep writing. So how do you free write? You just write down whatever you think and you keep writing and you keep writing. The goal is to keep writing, to put ideas on the page. 
after describing uh, how to do it, the essay will then explain what is the goal, what is the purpose, how can it be useful. This process often leads to new discoveries and insights, so it generates new ideas. Much or even all of free writing may not end up in the final draft, but writers can highlight the parts worth keeping and then do a second, more focused free writing. So you free write one time, you see if there are good ideas, then you take those ideas and you free write a second time, see if there are good ideas. Keep going until you have a collection of good ideas that you can then organize into an essay. Right after you do this a second, third time, by that point, they can turn to planning their essay. Another method discoverers often employ is brainstorming or listing ideas. So again, we're sticking with the discoverers, the new method, the name is called brainstorming, and what it is is you list down ideas and it continues to describe. They jot down their idea, uh, their thoughts in whatever order they occur. So you think of something, you write it down, you think of something, you write it down. After that initial step, they highlight the most important ideas, cross out the irrelevant ones, and reorganize whatever remains. So after brainstorming, then you again organize your ideas. They may even do a second more focused and detailed brainstorming list. So just like in free writing, do it once, organize, do it again, organize, until you have a collection of good ideas. This list shapes the first draft of the paper. Notice how this paragraph and the last paragraph are very similar. Which group of people? What is the name of the method? How do you do the method? Why do you do the method? Like, what do you want from this method? And then at the end, you are now ready to write your paper very similar structure. It's a very clear structure. Planners work more systematically than discoverers and organize their ideas from the very beginning. So now we know we're moving on to the next group of people, the planners. One way they generate and organize ideas is through a different version of brainstorming called clustering. So we have the name of the method, clustering, and it tells us it's very much like brainstorming. So we're already prepared to uh, meet a new method that looks familiar. It starts with drawing a circle in the middle of a page and writing a word or phrase inside the circle. That idea should lead to related ideas, each circled and then linked to the first circle by a line or branch. More circles and branches follow until they form clusters of ideas. So as it says, one circle, one word or phrase, and then you draw lines outward, and each line you write a related word or phrase, and you circle it, and you draw lines outward from the second circle, until you have a group of enough ideas to put together into an essay. Planners can then examine the clusters, decide which to keep or discard, and begin a second, more focused cluster diagram. And you keep going until you're ready to write the essay. So this paragraph structure is also very similar. Finally, of course, planners can rely on an outline. So the name of this method is an outline. One of the most efficient of these devices is the topic sentence outline. OK, so this tells us there are many kinds of outlines. 
Uh, today, we're only going to be talking about the kind called the topic sentence outline. How do you do this? It begins with a statement of the essay's thesis or main idea. Then it includes the topic sentences of the body paragraphs and their supporting details. So first you write the main idea of the essay, then you write the main idea of the first paragraph, and you write down the key information you need to explain that idea. Then you write down the main idea of the second paragraph and the key information you need to explain that idea, and you keep going until uh, you, up to the end of your plan. Not only does this type of outline help structure the essay, but it also provides a preliminary set of topic sentences for the first draft. So if you do this kind of outline, you have a general idea of the order of the essay. But if you do a good enough outline, you can actually take these sentences and put them directly into your essay. And all you have to do is add a few connecting sentences, a few examples, explanations, and you have your first draft. I tried this once in college, once. Um, and it, exactly as it says, I wrote a very detailed outline and when I wanted to start to write the essay, I realized that the outline was the essay. I just had to add like two or three sentences uh, for each paragraph and out came the full essay. Uh, most of the work of writing was done for the outline. Of course, many writers mix these methods or choose different ones depending on the project. OK, so at the beginning it said both kinds of writers begin from the first draft. Then it talked about discoverers and then it talked about planners and now it's bringing both groups back together. It kind of feels like a conclusion. Uh, like it's saying here are some ideas and you can choose which ones you want to use. In fact, no matter what method writers choose for getting started, they must keep in mind that each one is merely a way to begin the writing process. So this is just the beginning. Revision, dra uh, redrafting, editing and proofreading will follow. So after you begin writing, then you have to rewrite, you have to edit, you have to proofread, which means look for mistakes. Efficiency is the key word in writing. Why stare at a blank page and waste your time? Why attempt to write a perfect first draft when you know full well that you are going to revise it later? Try the approaches that have proved so valuable in helping writers, whether they are discoverers or planners. So you can tell this is the conclusion because first it summarizes. Here are some ideas. Choose which ones that are useful for you. Then it starts pushing the reader toward the future, right? This is just the beginning to to write an essay. You have so many more things you have to do later. And after showing the reader what lies in the future, then it comes back and it urges the reader to use these ideas. Right? There are so many things to do. Why waste your time? Try some of these ideas. So it pushes the reader forward. Uh, so that's the conclusion of this essay. It's a, the structure of this essay is very clear and uh, a very complete structure. Introduction, grab the reader's attention, build a connection, introduce the topic and the structure of the essay. Then follow one group of writers, then follow the other group of writers. Each paragraph introduces a new method in a similar order. Uh, and then at the end, 
summarize all that you have said and push the reader toward the future. So what is the order of this essay? Why does it first talk about discoverers and then planners? Why does it go free writing, brainstorming, clustering, outline? What's the order? I think the order is from messy chaos of ideas to starting to write a complete and good essay. Discoverers think on the page, so when they begin writing, it's still very messy. Planners already think and then they start writing, so when they start writing, it's already a bit organized. So it makes more sense to begin with the discoverers and then move on to the planners. Same with the four methods. Free writing is the messiest one. You just write and write and write and write and write. Brainstorming is slightly more organized because you already divide your words into ideas. First idea, second idea, third idea, fourth idea. Clustering is even more organized. Instead of a list, you have connections. Main idea, related idea, idea related to the related idea, and you have a, a picture of relations and importance. And then outlining is the most organized method. You already know which idea is the main idea, which idea is the most important for each paragraph, and what is the key information you need to explain each paragraph. So the order of this essay seems to be from chaos to order, from ideas to beginning the first draft. And that is the logic of why uh, each part of the essay appears in that order. Questions? OK, well, this is a pretty good exposition essay, but there are still things that can be improved. Um, even though it is a textbook essay. So let's talk about some things that can be improved. The first thing is the title. What are the two groups of people called? The planners and the discoverers, right? So why is the title explorers and planners? Very strange. If you're going to introduce two key words in your essay, you should use those key, and in your title is using those two ideas, you should use the same words. Uh, that way it's not as confusing. It's much more clear. Um, another thing that can be improved in this first paragraph. So these first two sentences, uh, as we mentioned, put the reader in the situation, grabs their attention, tells them this is important and useful information. But then it goes into a kind of scientific explanation about why you are in this situation. If the beginning part is using this is useful information to grab the reader, you don't really need to explain how did you end up in this situation. If the beginning of your essay is your kitchen is on fire, what do you do? You don't have to explain how does your kitchen catch on fire, right? The situation is it's on fire. You need useful information. So uh, if I were to edit this essay, I would take out these two sentences. I would. Uh, after they need not be serious obstacles, I would just jump to all those some experienced writers. Because this part is also focused on the reader, right? 
uh, you're you're facing a blank page. You don't know what to say. You've heard that some geniuses can do it. But don't worry, you're normal. That's what this is saying. So to me, the middle two sentences can be deleted uh, and it would improve this opening paragraph. Does that make sense? Tell what? Oh. Um, now, in this paragraph, um, there's two problems that I would fix. The first problem is that it, it begins with the two words, of course. Now, when you're writing an essay and you say, of course, or obviously, or I don't have to tell you, or we all know that something, something. You think everyone knows, but does your reader will really know? How can you be sure that your reader really knows what you're talking about? Let's think about this. If your reader knows what you're talking about and you don't say, of course, obviously, it doesn't matter. There's no difference. But if your reader does not know what you're talking about and you say, of course, obviously, it makes the reader feel like this essay did not think of them. You're not writing for this reader. It makes the reader not want to read your essay. Or maybe it makes your reader not trust you because you don't really understand the reader. So it's always a good idea to take away these words. When you're writing your rough draft, um, you might have the habit of saying, of course, or obviously. But when you revise, it's a good idea to take these out and delete them. The other problem is. Remember, the order of the essay is first discoverers and then planners. But here it first talks about planners and then it talks about discoverers. Uh, now again, readers can sometimes be confused if this order does not fit the order of the essay. It's always a good idea to make sure that the order on both sides is the same uh, order. So why does this paragraph reverse the order? It actually has a good reason to break this rule. And the reason is for balance, to make sure that uh, it's not top heavy, to make sure that it begins easily and it ends with more information than it begins. And the reason for that is because the only example is for the discoverer. The planner has no example. So when you talk about the planners, it's just three lines. But when you talk about discoverers, it's eight lines. It's much longer. And it's uh, usually a good idea to put the longer stuff near the end. Uh, and this is because uh, when we read, as I said, we read as a collection of information. If you don't understand the first thing, it will be hard to understand the second thing, and it will be even harder to understand the third thing. You always want to start simple. Make sure the reader can follow you, and then you can get more and more complicated. So if we wanted to make the order of planners and discoverers follow the same order as the essay, how can we fix this problem? Well, the easiest way is to give an example for the planner. Right, that way it's not top heavy, it's not bottom heavy, it's equal. And so you can choose which one to put first. There's also a small grammar mistake here. The Nobel Prize winning author. It's missing a dash. It should be like this.
right? It's missing this dash. This is a noun plus verb turned into an adjective. So you it's one word. Nobel Prize winning is one word. So it needs that dash. Uh, OK. The middle paragraphs are all pretty good. They follow the same clear structure. And then uh, these last two paragraphs. Of course. I should be deleted. And also the word finally, you don't really need the word finally. I know a lot of you like to write uh, first, second, third or. First, next, then. Or like moreover, additionally. Or like however. Therefore. You don't need these words. You don't need any of these words. If your essay is clearly organized, if your ideas follow a clear order, then even without these words, the reader will be perfectly clear where they are in the essay. So like if you have a textbook, a paper textbook, and you see the whole essay on the same page, you don't need the word finally. You can tell the essay ends after paragraph eight. You don't you don't need the word finally. Um, in fact, using these words, these are called transition words. Um, using these words is a sign of student writing. It's it's something that teachers like to teach students when they learn how to write. So in fact, if you can write a clear essay, that readers can follow without using these words. It is a better essay and it's something I hope you can practice. OK, questions about this essay? OK, let's do some practice questions. Uh, this one. So. Each question is a bad thesis statement. It needs more detail. So for example, the first one, learning a new language is not easy. How can you add more detail to this main idea? Well, when you say learning, what kind of learning? And when you say not easy, why not? And so the example answer is mastering the pronunciation of a new language can be challenging for several reasons. So instead of just learning a language, it's learning the pronunciation of a language, fying. And instead of not easy, you let the reader know that there are several reasons why it's not easy. And so the rest of your essay will be explaining each of those reasons. So um, during the break, why don't you guys try uh, numbers two to six? How can you add more detail to each thesis statement? Uh, I'll give you 15 minutes. Uh, and then I will ask, I will invite you to share your answers with the class. And I will invite you by calling your name from the sheet. OK, let's take a short break. I may chin. OK, that you mentioned.
five more minutes. Thirty seconds. OK, that feels like 30 seconds. Uh, so let's start from number two. My family has some interesting people. How can you add more detail to this one? Sanyanting. Sanyanting. Hi, yes. So what do you have for question two?
your classmate has kindly volunteered a different question, so we'll come back to her later. Uh, for question two. Liu Guanyi. Hi, so what do you have for question two? So your classmates answer is to give more information about why they are interesting. So instead of just my family, he says some of my family members. And instead of interesting, he says has some interesting jobs. Right? Good. So that adds more detail and the rest of your essay will be explaining the different interesting jobs of the people in your family. OK, good, thank you. Number three, school requires hard work. How can you expand this? Yes, what do you have for question three? OK, so uh, you're explaining why it requires hard work. So your answer is school requires hard work or you will fail the test. OK, so that does explain why hard work is important. Maybe we can add a bit more detail. Um, for example, instead of school, you can say when you take classes in school. Because uh, schools don't have tests. Classes have tests. So it fits more. If you're talking about tests, it fits more to talk about classes. You can also think about what kind of hard work you need to do in order to pass the test. So you can say like, if you take classes in school, you need to pay attention in class and uh, study at home in order to pass the test. That way you have more detailed information uh, and the rest of your essay would be about what is it, what does it mean to take a class? Uh, how can you pay attention in class? How can you study at home? And how they help you pass tests. Number four, the Internet is useful, but that sentence is not very useful. How can we make it more useful? Chen Jingle. Hi, what do you have for question four? So your classmate says, uh, the internet is useful for facts and figures, information, entertainment, many different things, and many people depend on it. Uh, so that is much more information. It's very, uh, it's a very detailed thesis statement. And you know, as a thesis statement, it's good. It's okay. But then I'm starting to worry. How long will, will your essay be? Because in your thesis statement, you're supposed to mention the key information that you will talk about in your essay. So when your thesis statement has so many points, maybe the essay will become longer than you expect. Now in this class, uh, there's no limit on how long your essay should be. Um, as long as you can give it enough time and energy to write a complete essay, that's fine. Uh, but I do encourage you, um, I'm sure you're taking more classes than just this class. So, you know, you should try to balance your schedule. Uh, so if you want to write a longer essay, you can uh, go ahead and do that. Just make sure you have time for your other classes and activities. 
but as a thesis statement, it's a good it's a good sentence. Number five. A college education is important. How can we add more detail? Sun Yinting. So your classmate added some details about why it's important. She says a college education is important because it can help you find a job more easily. Um, that's pretty good. Then your essay will be about how. Uh, what is the connection between college education and finding a job? Um, we can add a little more detail, maybe like what part of a college education? Is it the degree needed to show? Is it some classes? Is it like clubs and other things you do in college? If you can give more detail about the first part, then you can make more clear connections between those ideas and finding a job. Yeah. So if you can add more detail, it'll help you uh, finish your essay, plan and write out your essay. OK, one more. I write best under the right conditions. Yeri Hall. What do you have for us? So your classmate is expanding the idea of the right conditions. So he says, I write best when I have a clear idea and I feel confident. That's good. So then you can connect the idea of good writing with clear ideas and then good writing with being a confident writer. Um, we can improve this a little bit by explaining what we mean when we say, I write best. Does it mean I can write faster? Does it mean that I can produce a better essay? So um, if you give a little more detail on the first part, you can again draw clearer connections with the second part. OK, all right, good. Uh, questions about this practice? OK, so I hope you starting to feel what is a good main idea for an essay? So that was the introduction. Now let's practice the conclusion. Let's do this together. Uh, so each question gives you two sentences and asks you which one is the better conclusion. The first one is an example. Question uh, 1A. In short, the only solution to getting writing done is to write, write, and write. B. Try not to postpone writing an assignment. And the answer is that A is the better conclusion. Why? Well, first of all, it says in short which is a kind of concluding sentence, a concluding phrase. But if we ignore that, the only solution, so there's only one way to do this. It feels like it's the end of the paragraph, right? You, you Maybe you talked about different ways, but in the end, there's only one way. And if you look at sentence B, it says, try not to do something. It feels like we can talk a bit more about this idea, right? Try not to, but if you do, then what? 
it's, it doesn't it doesn't feel like the end of the paragraph. There's more that you can say about this. So let's look at question two. A. Another thing to consider is your audience. Uh, in this case, audience means your reader. B. Always try to anticipate your audience's questions to prepare for your audience's questions. Which one's the better conclusion? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. OK, some people think B, some people are not quite sure. Let's look at uh, these sentences. The first one says another thing. Which means I have talked about some things. Here's a new thing. So that's not a conclusion, right? It gives you a new thing. It has to discuss this new thing. Uh, if you look at sentence B, always do something. It feels like this after discussing a lot of things, the conclusion is you should always do this thing. But it says try, always try to anticipate. So it could be the conclusion to a paragraph. It doesn't sound like the conclusion to an essay. But if you compare these two sentences, B seems to be the better conclusion. Make sense? OK, let's try question three. A, writing is a continual process of drafting and revision that stops only when the paper is due. B, writing involves a lot of revision if it is going to be any good. Which one's the better conclusion? What do you think? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. OK, not quite sure. So let's compare. Sentence A says writing is you do this, you do that, you do it again, you do it again until you're finished, right? It stops only when, so there's an ending. B says you have to revise again and again. It feels like A gives you an endpoint, but B doesn't tell you when to stop. So it feels like A might be the better conclusion. Uh, it, it's a better conclusion than B. Does that make sense? And also like A gives you a bit more information, drafting and revision, but B only says revision. And as we mentioned earlier, Usually we like to give more information near the end of a paragraph or essay. OK, question four. A, will you spend the time to do it well? If not, then you may be wasting your reader's time. B, writing requires time. Which one's the better conclusion? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. Ah, OK, so there's disagreement. Personally, I think that both could work as a conclusion. But B can only be used in uh, a, a kind of writing where um, for most of the paragraph, you're talking about how much time you need to write a good essay. And after explaining all of the time issues, your final conclusion is writing requires time. But A can also be a conclusion. Uh, because it has an ending, right? You may be wasting your readers time if you don't take my advice. But notice one thing about sentence A. Will you spend time to do it well? What is it? 
it's something that was explained earlier in the essay. So A cannot be the introduction sentence. B can be introduction or conclusion, but A cannot be introduction. So it seems like between these two, A is the better conclusion. Five, A. Writing, says one well-known author, is thinking. B. Writing demands constant thought. Which one's the better conclusion? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. OK, good. So again, we have a similar kind of sentence with 4B, right? Short feels like it could be a conclusion, and it could be. Um, if you compare A and B, they both have the same main idea, right? To write well, you have to think. The difference is that sentence B gives you one idea, but sentence A gives you two ideas. The first idea is writing is thinking. The second idea is don't just trust me. The other famous guy agrees with me. And so because we like to begin simple and end with more ideas, A is actually uh, closer to the end of the paragraph. Both sentences are exactly the same except for the number of ideas. So if both sentences appear in the same paragraph, B comes first, and then you have A. Does that make sense? OK, last one. A, as I said earlier, keep all these things in mind. B, in sum, effective writing requires planning, drafting, and revision. Which one's the better conclusion? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. OK, so uh, most of you think B. Some, some of you think A, so let's compare. Both of these sentences begin with a phrase that tells you this is a conclusion. As I said earlier, so there's lots of stuff in front. In sum, which means in conclusion. But look at the amount of information. A, keep all these things in mind. OK, so the essay talked about some things. But here we don't know exactly what things. B, effective writing requires A, B, and C. Very clear summary. So both of these sentences go at the end of a paragraph or the end of an essay. But which one is the better sentence? B is the better sentence. It gives you a clearer summary of what we have talked about in the essay. A simply tells you remember. It doesn't tell you what to remember. B tells you remember A, B, and C. So in this case, B is the better conclusion. OK, do you have questions about this practice? OK, so I want to remind you about the schedule. Next week, we're going to uh, look at the example essay. And then week four, you guys will do peer review. So next week, before next week, I will divide you into groups on teams. And then in class next week, I will announce the teams, give you some time to meet your group members. Uh, and then you have to discuss with your group members when is the deadline to exchange essays before you come to class and discuss them. Because when you come to class on week four, 
You have already read your group members' essays. You have ideas for how to improve those essays, and you will share your ideas with your group members. I will explain next week how to do that. But this means that you have to exchange essays with your group members before class on week four. Um, you will need some time to read the essays, so I suggest maybe uh, a deadline of Thursday or Friday might be reasonable. So you can already begin thinking about what you want to write for your exposition essay. Choose your own topic. Uh, there's no length requirement as long as it is a complete essay. You say everything that should be said about the topic. Uh, yeah, so next week you will meet your group members, choose a date to exchange essays, and then week four you will come and do peer review. So for the rest of today, you can use this time to brainstorm, think about what you want to write. And you can talk with your friends and classmates. I will be here if you have questions. 然后还没签到的话，可以来来签到。